Um, I have some wonderful news for you because the world is on fire with this local bee thing. Um, you guys are in it at just the right time. And before too long, you are going to be the most popular people in your bee club. Um, I know you don't believe me now, but it's true. And, and some of you will email me in a year or so and say, my gosh, I had no idea. I mean, people I didn't even know are coming up wanting to be my best friend. Because the Africanized bees are getting into the southern queen-rearing traditional areas, and um, everybody's going to start to get scared. You know, they, they had the guy on the, on the bulldozer down there that was killed by the Africanized bees in Georgia. Everybody's getting a little nervous about bringing hot bees up from the south. And uh, these Africanized bees are not going to stop until they get to that line that they've drawn of heat and humidity. And Because they, fortunately, they live, they're stupid. They live outside, you know, on, on limbs. And so they get up north, they die. But they can live during the summer if you bring them up here. And people are going to be very worried about bringing very hot bees up here. They're just nasty things to deal with. So this year, um, Gabe, all, all of the people that are raising local queens will tell you, I mean, my phone rang off the hook. Everybody wants queens. Every couple of days, I'm getting an email or a phone call from somebody in my area. And I've got so much demand in my area, I don't ship anymore. I've had occasional problems with shipping where you've had to replace queens. Something happened. And, and so I don't have to ship anymore. And so I tell people, gee, I'm sorry, I, I'd love to help you, but you're three hours away or four hours away, I can't ship. I'll drive to your house. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So um, uh, you, you, as I say, are going to be very popular people soon. This is not rocket science. I swear to God it is not. Um, you come to Gabe in my class this afternoon, you will go home and you will be making queens next weekend. Um, we will teach you in 15 minutes how to make queens. We have queen rearing for dummies. That's that's me and me and Gabe Black back there, my buddy Black. Um, I I, um, uh, I started the West Virginia Queen Producers five years ago, and because of my efforts, I suppose it's because of that, because I don't know what else I've done. Uh, the West Virginia Beekeeper Association chose me as the Beekeeper of the Year in 2011, and that made me feel really good. <laughs> The route to success. You see, if you start raising queens, soon you will be beekeeper of the year in your state. That's another road to success. Jim, I'm telling you, I'm trying to give them the glide path to the future. We did have some te technical difficulties, and if Jason can't figure it out, it can't be figured out. I uh, was so proud of myself, I embedded movies inside of PowerPoint. I saw somebody do it, and I said, well, I'll do that. It piped it. It just worked like gangbusters, but the sound wouldn't go overhead. So we fixed the sound. Now the movies won't play. So I'm going to have to switch back and forth. Jason showed me how to do it between my PowerPoint and the movies. So it'll take just a second between each one, and then I'll play the movies as a separate thing. They're not inside the PowerPoint anymore. I do want to tip my hat to Dana Stallman. Dana is your uh, head of, of what I call the Ohio Queen Program. It's been about 10 different iterations, but Dana's always been the one who's been constant throughout it. Dana is absolutely a visionary leader, and he's got it right up here. Dana and I work together. Um, we we swap <coughs> genetics between the Ohio Program and the West Virginia Program. We take their best, and they're going to take our best, and we're going to try them out. Uh, he's a wonderful guy, and he uh, let me use some of his slides because he had some really beautiful pictures. I think maybe Nina takes pictures or Dwight or somebody gives them yeah. to him. Anyway, um, so um, this is this is the girl we're all looking for at the end with the big uh, the big crocodile butt. I say going out from the back of her, and now we're going to flip over and let's see if we can get a movie playing here. This is um, this is what I call failure. <laughs> so let's start by seeing failure. This is what you don't want to see when you get in your hive. Just bring your hand towards that's it. See it up there. That's the queen cells. You do not want the bees to decide they're going to make queens for you one day. <laughs> because that means you're probably not going to get any honey out of that hive. Swarm. And so you don't want to open and find out that the bees have taken over your queen producing business. You want to take over the queen production from the bees. So um, this is going to be goofy going back and forth. But we'll do it. Um, so I'm supposed to talk about queen and drone biology at 8.30 in the morning. Who, who hates me, Dr. T? <laughs> Did these people not get enough sleep last night? This is supposed to give them a little extra rest. So there, there's really only a couple of things you absolutely positively have to know about queen biology, and then I'll talk about drone biology, and that is 16 days from the day the egg is laid, you have got to have the queen cell in another um, mating nuke of some kind. You've got to have her out or she will be out and then there'll be problems inside the hive. And um, I will tell you how important it is. Me and my, no not yet, we'll, we'll do that in a minute, thank you. 
Uh, me and my partner Gabe, my partner in crime up there, raised our first batch of queens, and so uh, I took them back to my place in a finisher, and you'll learn all about starters and finishers, but we put them in a finisher, and I said, now, okay, get out here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So Gabe will tell you what, we'll come back on Thursday, and then that way we'll have them in our, get your mating nukes ready on Thursday. This is just this last Thursday. Have your mating nukes ready, and we'll pull that frame out, right, cap queen cells ready to go. Pull them off of there and have them ready to put in your mating nukes, and I'll have mine in my mating nukes, and we'll be fine. And then we'll go to we'll go to Wooster and we'll tell them all what great queen producers we are. So I thought we counted on our fingers and toes, and I lifted that frame up, and boy, Mrs. Blatt did not raise any dumb kids. Three of them had that little submarine hatch open, you know, and there's just a <laughs> hole in the bottom and an empty queen cell. And Gabe said, my God, look, three of yours are already out. <laughs> you better go find them. They're probably fighting in there somewhere. So we grabbed the other ones and put them in as many as he could. So, uh, uh, and here's the deal. So, you know, you're driving up here. My gosh, I've got to tell these people that I, I'm teaching them queen producing, and I screwed up two days ago. What happens, I think, is that you say this is a 12-hour-old larva. Because you want to get it just after it falls over. You know, it's an egg for three days, sticking up, starting to bend, starting to bend, and then falls over and they put a little royal jelly around it. That's the time you want to get it, when it's just turned into a larva. Well, my eyes probably aren't what they once were when I was 20. And it may look like a 12-hour-old larva, but maybe it's a 27-hour-old larva. Maybe it's got 12 hours on the other ones. Maybe it's going to emerge a half a day earlier. Or maybe just biologically it's going to emerge a little earlier. You know, not everything is exactly nine months to the day in a pregnancy, is it? Huh? So sometimes it's eight months and a half. Sometimes it's nine months and two days. I mean, biologically, there's a bell curve. Maybe these three queens just emerged a little bit early. Maybe I put in larvae that were just a little bit older than the sisters. Anyway, so I, when I go back uh, tomorrow, I've got to find those three. Of course, I won't find three. Well, I'll find one. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's going to be the problem. And in fact, that leads me right to my next movie. Let's get rid of this. And let's find the pipping sound. You'll hear about this. I don't know why they do it, Jim. Do you know why they pip? To tell each other they're there? As so far as I know, those queens are using that comb as a substrate, and they can feel the comb vibrating someplace else, and that's the way for those queens to come together. The workers take no interest in it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the queens, when they're in the queen cell and somebody emerges, they start talking to one another. They, hey, hey, I'm over here, and I, I don't like you. Come over here. I want to, I want to sting you. And so I actually found a movie here of Pippin. If I can get it going here. Now there's a queen walking around on there, and this other one can sense that or smell that. She's going to start saying, see that? That's an interesting sound. It's hard to be there right at the exact time. Somebody did a good job getting this movie. But I just thought it would be interesting for you to hear it. I, I kept these 25 years before I ever first actually heard that inside a hot. All right, that's probably as much fun as we need to have with that anyway. All right, off with their heads. So that's Pippin. And, uh, and my three queens that uh, Gabe wanted me to dive in that hive and go find, my three little virgins were all in there probably Pippin at one another, and they were going to fight it out because they do not like one another. They, one is going to survive when it's virgins. Um, you'll hear at some point about two queen hives of Roger Hoopengarten or something. That's after they've been mated and after they've come back. And sometimes you'll see a mother and a daughter on the same frame. It's been superseded, but not two virgins. Two virgins want to kill each other. And uh, Nina told me that they were in their uh, bees the other day and saw something unusual. And uh, maybe Dwight, Dwight's story. Anyway, this is getting around, but uh, they had a virgin. They saw her emerge, and she walked over the frame, and she grabbed a drone and just started stabbing that thing. I mean, she was just like, maybe just in a bad mood. But anyway, <laughs> that poor drone can't stay back. Maybe she was just practicing. I don't know, but I, I've never seen a queen. She got a hold of this drone, and she was just giving it up the road. So anyway, they're just in a bad mood when they come out, and they just want up. They want, they want to go sting something. And uh, if they can find another queen, that's exactly what they'll do. So very, very important, this 16 days. And in fact... 
Uh, I'm going to ask my friend Gabe and, and somebody else to hand out this queen calendar I'm going to give to you. <coughs> you can start passing them out if you would. There is, uh, you can find these on the internet or uh, Denny Lamb will take them to your house and tack them on your, bee, uh, your beehive or whatever. Just keep records. Um, uh, even when I was keeping records with the queen calendar, I was off by just a few hours with our queens. But maybe take them out, uh, you know, don't wait until the last day like I did. Maybe take them out after the 10th day. What you don't want to do, here's the next important thing about queen biology. You don't want to move them between the 6th day. They'll be capped after the 6th day. In other words, they'll start building that big queen cell down, and they'll cap it on the 5th or 6th day. You don't want to touch it between day 5 and day 10. The queen's in there. She's going through her various molts. She's developing wings. She's developing legs. She's developing thorax. And you don't want to turn that queen cell up and down. She can get... She can get stuck in a certain position and not be able to develop properly. In other words, she's very fragile between day 5 and day 10. Leave them alone. Don't touch them. But after day 10, she's finished. She's just growing in there. She's fine. She's, she's not as fragile anymore. And so after day 10 of, of the days after you graft it, not day 10 from the day her egg was laid. Remember, you've got to add three days on because you're taking the, the egg hatches after three days. It's an egg for three days, then it becomes a larva. Don't graft eggs. Don't graft eggs. Don't graft eggs. If you use the Ginter method, don't do what Dan did the first time. Well, if, if larva are good, eggs must be better. No, they aren't. They'll just eat the eggs. You put them in there, you'll come back, they'll have, they'll have no queen cells. They just, they won't raise eggs. They want larva. And they want larva that are pointed downward. Larva pointed downward means make a queen. Something triggers something in them. So they're three days old when you graft them. Um, the younger the larva, the better the queen. You can graft them between the first day it's a larva, the second, and the third day, and they will make a queen. But if you get them on the first day, you'll get a better queen than if you graft a two-day-old egg. If you graft them on the third day, it'll be worse than if you grafted a second-day egg. You want it to be the youngest possible larva. Not an egg anymore, larva. How do you know it's an egg? There'll be a little royal jelly under it. Not much royal jelly, but a little royal jelly under it. You mean a larva? Larva, did I say egg? Sorry yeah, about that. I think no, sorry about that. Well, you'll know it's gone from an egg to a larva because it'll have a little royal jelly underneath it. Now, if the, the, the temptation, if you, if you graft, and some of you may graft, some of you may want to do it the hard way, the grafting way. It's the traditional way. Um, and, and in some ways, it's a fast way to do it. You will be tempted to take the larva you can see. That's a mistake. That's what Sue Kobe taught me. If you can see it, it's probably too old. That's the metric. So um, it's just such a tiny, teensy little comma of a thing in just a teensy little bed of royal jelly. That's what you're looking for. And when you come into this cell punch method class that Gabe and I teach, we will show you the way to do this. And you will be, you will be making queens in 15 minutes. Today, you will be making queens in 15 minutes. When you leave there, you will have so much confidence that you can do this. So, you don't have those eyes, do you? Are they in the other room? Gabe is going to go get you something that really, really helps. And they sell them in the bee magazines. It's a kind, it looks like welder's glasses. They, there's a little strap that goes around your head, and then there's these, these eye pieces that come down. You can get them in 3X or 5X. And they make that little teeny egg look that big. <laughs> Even I can see them. I put these eyes down, and I look in, and boing, suddenly, wow, that's what I'm looking for. Right there, a teeny little larva with a little bit of royal jelly on it. Here they are. Hold that up. You see what I'm talking about? This, whether you, especially if you graft, but whatever way you do it, you put this around, you tighten it, and you can go up and then down like this, and you look down, and suddenly it's 3x or 5x, and suddenly you can see what you're doing. If you graft, buy these. You will be glad. Even if you are young and think you have great eyes, buy that. Because... You will be tempted to take a larva that's too old if you don't, because it's easier to see. It's yeah. Will a regular magnifying glass do? It, yeah, except you know you got a magnifying glass in this hand and you're doing it with that hand. This <coughs> lets you have both hands. It would work. 
And in fact, they have, if you want to really go to the expense, they've got a light with a magnifying glass you can look through and a kind of a fluorescent light and a ring around it. Okay. And I, I've seen guys do that. They, they, they put that right down over there and they look down through the magnifying glass and the light is going right down inside there. And you can reach inside and grab, or you can do the cell punch. So it clamps onto the desk. It clamps onto the desk. Yeah. What You're, about a pair of, say, magnifying reading glasses perfect. from the dollar store? Gabe, you okay. have yours. Gabe, if, if Gabe, my partner in crime in the back there, he found those. Where'd you find them? Some kind of a Harbor Freight. Harbor yeah. Freight. So <laughs> anyway, or they, or something. it's for people that do fly fishing and need to tie yeah. the little knots. And this this little magnifier goes down right over your glasses. So there's just a pair of regular reading glasses. They were. The dollar, something, yeah. Just something to magnify. Something to magnify. You're getting the point now. You guys are all getting with the program. Magnifiers. Make this big so you're not tempted to take a larva that's too old. Um, and, and today, somebody's going to take you out to the hive and they're going to lift out a frame of larva, and you're going to look inside and go, God, this is so, how am I going to get that out of there and, and over into a, you know, grafting cell? I mean, this is. That's hard. That, to me, that's the hardest part of queen raising. <clears throat> so we're going to show you an easy way to get around that. But the first thing you need to do, see, I even have to put glasses on to see what I'm going to say next. <laughs> all right, so, all right, so let's see. My next one, pipping. All right, so now we want a virgin queen emergent. Let's see where that is. All the, right. all the way to the bottom. Virgin queen emergent. There we go. Let's see what this girl's doing. Control F. Oh, this is kind of neat. <clears throat> this is, I think, in Spanish, and it takes a little while, but this guy's found the queen cell in there, and he's taking it out. Don't do this at home. I mean, this is stupid, but he does. He's got a big thing he's cutting it open with, but he wants to show you what it looks like when a queen comes out of this cell into the mating dish. <clears throat> so, the bees themselves, the worker bees, will actually go down, and they will chew off the outside of the wax. You'll see they thinned it out. It doesn't look like a peanut on the bottom anymore because they've kind of made it real thin and then she's chewing from the inside and at some point what I call the submarine hatch just flips open and she walks out and you'll see her actually walk out. There she is. See her? See that big butt? I mean, people say, gee, how do you find the queen? I mean, eventually your eyes will just start seeing that. And I'm going to give you another hint because people say there's no foolproof way to find a queen when you have to find a queen. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Take another queen, put her in a cage, put a cork on it, and set her up on those top bars. And my God, your queen will come and find her. <laughs> you will not have to find the queen. She will find you. You wait about two minutes, and she will, she will be up there. She will be going, who are you? And get out of my hive, because I want to kill you. So, <clears throat> anyway, that's, there is a little tip. When you absolutely positively have to find the queen, because somebody's there waiting to buy it, and that's the day you can't find the queen. All right. Next, super, super important point. There's only about three or four things you really have to know about queen biology to get all this right. This, this is the holy grail of queen bees. That is royal jelly. Royal jelly. <clears throat> That's what makes a queen a queen. Everybody gets it for a couple of days. Queens get it for the whole time they're there. Queens have lots of it in there when they cap it over, so she keeps eating that. The more royal jelly that's in there, the bigger your queen is going to be. Size matters in queen raising. They have done test after test that the queens that are bigger have longer abdomens, which have more ovarials in them, which have laid more eggs. They have the capacity to have more eggs before they run out of steam and can't do it anymore. <clears throat> so you want the biggest, longest queen, not one of those little stubby things. Get rid of those queens. You want a big, long queen, <clears throat> so you want that absolutely gobbed up with royal jelly. How do you do that? <clears throat> you do that by artificially creating a swarm-type situation inside the hive, inside what we call the starter. You take a little uh, nuke box. Denny, have, have we got Denny around here? Denny, yeah. Denny makes them. Denny, Denny made me a fabulous little starter, <laughs> and it looks like a little five-frame nuke, but it's on the sides, it's got all kinds of, of uh, screening. And it's a little deeper than a normal nuke. And it doesn't have an opening. You, you know, in other words, you're going to put a lid on it, and there's no way for them to get in and out. You only keep them in there for a day. 
But the best way to start queens is to do a starter without a queen in it. You want the bees to sense there's no queen in this hive, and you really only want young nurse bees in this starter. How do you get them in there? Well, you shake them off of frames that have got eggs. Go in your hive, you find a frame of uncapped brood. If you can't, find cat brood, because the nurse bees will probably be around that too. And you shake those off into your starter. And then you shake some more, and you shake some more, and you shake some more, and you shake some more, until you say, there's not another bee can fit in this thing. Then you're ready. Then you're ready. Now, um, you put two frames on one side, two frames on the other, and leave that center open, and the, you know, of course the bees will fill it up. And then when you've done your grafting, you just kind of gently work that um, uh, frame of grafted larva inside that middle slot there, and they are desperate to raise queens. Desperate to raise queens. There is no queen. They've been looking around. They've got no queen pheromone in them. You know, They're not passing it around like they do inside a regular hive, and they say, my God, if we don't get a queen, we will die. You don't have to leave it set for a little bit? Absolutely. Time. Leave it set overnight or leave it set for 12 hours in a cool, dark place. But here's the genius of Mr. Denny Lamb and that he got out of Dr. Larry Connor's book that you were given here because Larry Connor came up with this design. Our other partner in crime down in West Virginia is Wade Stiltner. And Wade has killed these little starters by leaving them in a cool place overnight. But these bees generate enormous amounts of heat. Enormous amounts of heat. And he's come back the next day and it's been dead. Dead from the enormous amount of heat they have just burned themselves up and suffocated. So the way Denny does it, and the way Dr. Connor talks about it in the book that you're going to take home with you, you put this, um, you put this screening all around so there's lots of ventilation so that they don't just overheat themselves and die. And there's extra room in the bottom below the frames for the bees to go down into, you know, so that you can really load it up with bees. And you put a little sponge in the bottom with some moisture for them so that they have something to drink. Leave them overnight. And then when you come back, A, they know there's no queen in there, so they really want to raise queens. B, their hyperpharyngeal glands are absolutely gobbed up with this royal jelly. They need to get rid of it. There's no eggs in there anywhere. You've put in frames of honey and, and pollen because uh, they need the pollen to make the royal jelly and maybe a couple of frames or maybe a frame of honey and then just a frame of wax because they also need to get rid of the wax. And when you put this frame of grafted larva inside there, they go wild on it. they got to get rid of this royal jelly. That's how you can get 48 queen cells in a starter. That's how you can get 72 queen cells in a starter, 24. However many you've got, they will load it up with this royal jelly. And that's what you want to see. The more royal jelly there is in there, the better off you're going to be as a queen producer. You're going to make big queens. When we pulled these, <coughs> these uh, cells out of our starter, these things were just as long as your little finger, and just as stubby as your thumb. That's what you're looking for. And Nina, tell them about that thing that they pulled out. That queen must have been on steroids oh, or something. Oh, she was huge. She looked like a round of mushroom. Yeah, I mean, it looked like a big old chunky mushroom. That's what you want. Big, huge queen cells filled with royal jelly, and you know you're going to get a big, fat, long budded queen, lots of uh, ability to lay eggs. That's what you're looking for. So <clears throat> that's the most important thing. Dr. Connor likes these um, kind of what I call transparent plastic things that you graft into. <clears throat> I'm, I'm more Mr. Natural, you know, I kind of like the. But the one advantage to Dr. Connor's thing is that you can actually see the next morning in this starter how much royal jelly is in there. You can, you can kind of see in there. You'll see that it's gobbed up with royal jelly or it isn't. And the ones that aren't, don't, don't put, pull them now. Don't, don't waste your time. Get rid of them. You want the ones that are just full of royal jelly. That's what. That's the best thing you can have. All right. So let's get to. I've told you about. I've told you about failure. What I'd like to get to here is success. This is, uh, as I say, the royal jelly. Oh, here's the other important thing about queen biology. This is more like. You see how that larva is seated on one side. It's lying on its side in that royal jelly. They breathe through little spiracles, and they have them on each side of what we would call their neck. And the part that's up in the royal jelly, they have closed that off. I mean, hell, they're laying in jelly. They don't want that open. And they're breathing through the ones on top. When you go to graph, they will tell you, if you flip her over like an egg that's instead of over, you know, instead of Sunny side up, it's over easy. You flip her over, she's, she's dead. 
She's dead. She cannot close these spiracles and open these fast enough, and she will, she'll drown. So this is why grafting is hard, difficult, and people fail. People, it's hard to get that thing under there. You'll find out today when you try it. It's hard, and of course, this is, this is a big one. This is, this is several days old. This is a teeny little thing, teensy, smaller than a little teeny fingernail that would come off of you, and you're supposed to stick something under her and get it under the royal jelly and not touch the larva and take it without flipping it and then get it off inside your queen cell. You're supposed to do that 24 times in a row. Perfect. I tried. I did. I tried and I had some success, but not like the success I had where you don't touch this thing at all with the cell punch method or the ginger method. So we'll show you today what we do, but be careful. If you're grafting and you decide you want to graft, then you can't flip this thing over. Biologically, it cannot survive if you flip that larva over. And it'll die and the bees will just remove it and you'll come back and there'll be just an empty spot where there should be a queen cell and you've sort of wasted your efforts. <coughs> All right. So, this is, if you use the Miller method, Denny, you're teaching that, aren't you? The Miller method? You're teaching the Miller method when we go around? Yeah. This is what Denny's going to teach you. This is kind of a way of, again, hands-free um, beekeeping where you don't have to graft. Uh, you cut a V and, and, uh, and the eggs are right on the edge and, and the bees start pulling them down and then you come out and you, you cut those queen cells out and you put them in a mating nuke. And that's, that's certainly a valid way to do it. Um, when I find a queen cell, like I did on that first thing where I said this is failure, sometimes I'll just cut that out and put it inside a little plastic cell protector and they've given you some of these. They've given you some of these cell protectors in your kit here somewhere. These red things. Can I open your kit? Thank you. Um, these red things that are inside, these red things that have got a little uh, prong that's sticking out there, these are cell protectors. So if you actually go in and find queen cells like that, you can cut that queen cell and kind of set it down in there and then shove that into the side of, uh, you know, your, your brood nest or someplace, wherever you want the queen to emerge in your mating nuke, and then she'll emerge and she'll come down to the bottom there. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's... Why waste a queen cell? Why you know, turn failure into success, in other words? If you go out there and there's a nice supersedure cell or a swarm cell down on the bottom, um, you know, you can turn that into you can turn that into success. You can raise a queen from it. I would prefer the supersedure cell to the swarm cell. Swarm cells are are um, uh, I think the supersedure cell has usually more royal jelly. There's usually just one of them. Sometimes there's a couple. But um, they're preparing a new queen, and they do a good job. And remember, all those nurse bees are just dealing with one queen cell, so what's it full of? Royal jelly, Royal jelly right? So um, the, you know, the more queen cells you have, it just depends on whether you've got enough nurse bees up there to make nice, long, fat queens. But you, know, you can also see the queens when they emerge. Yes, ma'am? Uh, what's another way to attach, like once you've cut the queen cells away, like for instance, we did some graft, and we probably screwed it all up right no. now, but if you went in there to... <clears throat> put those on, like to pull them out, they're huge. Like yeah. there's no way they fit in there. No way they, when they fit in there. And so if you get enough wax off the top, you can take a toothpick, put it okay. through the top. But God, don't put it through her, you know, her abdomen. I've seen people do this. I mean, she's trying to get out and it's like, <laughs> hello. Because it looks like, like the ours right now, like, if they just keep building wax around it, is that normal? Hey, there's a great point. And in fact, they did that in this thing that Gabe and I pulled up. Um, Here's a, that's, I'm really glad you asked me that. Here's something that Sue Kobe taught me, especially this time of year that really helps with that. You've also got a lot of wax fillers inside of that starter and finisher. And you need to have them have something to do with that wax. So if every frame you put in there is already fully drawn out wax, where will they put that wax? Just where she found it. Just where Gabe and I found it. They'll web your queen cells together. I mean, they'll almost do a frame. They'll almost start drawing out laying honey and pollen and stuff down between your queen cells. That's very hard to get undone. So I always put a frame of foundation inside my, my starter and my finisher. Give them something to work on that's useful in the hell. I'm oh, should frame. that queen be okay? <clears throat> queen will be fine, but she had a lot to chew through. Those three that got out in that one I was telling you about, and no, I was just kidding, Gabe wouldn't really do me that way. But uh, anyway, um, uh, that, that, that they have a lot of, of wax to chew through to get out. Now, they'll chew through it. I mean, it's life or death. They'll chew through it or they'll die. But still, you'd rather not have all that webbing around that. They've got to do something with that wax, just like they have to do something with the royal jelly. All right. 
So uh, there's a number of ways that you can attach them. And uh, let's see. So. There she is. All right, this is success, folks. This is what you're looking for. This, I don't know how somebody got this picture. This is cool. This is the queen emerging from the queen cell. I don't know that you'll ever, like if you raise queens long enough, I guess you'll see this. This is what we're all shooting for, the day when this happens. And you have controlled every bit of from start to finish. And you can pat yourself on the back and be proud of yourselves. Because you are raising northern queens and saving the world. Without you, there will be no bees, no beekeepers. Without you, this stuff will end. That's a miracle to me. See your fighter way out of that? You don't want that webbing around there. You don't want to make it hard. You want to make it easy for you. Now, you don't want to be the girl in the next cell. <laughs> you don't want to be the one that's an hour late. You're not going to make it out of the cell. Look. Ah, that's what you want. Huh? Come on. That's mm -hmm. great. All right. So, we are almost done with queen biology. I know you're having trouble believing that, but it's true. Um, because I'm going to jump ahead here to this, and I'm going to read you something. Wow. This is an email that Gabe Black got and sent on to me from somebody who was sitting in a chair just like your sitting <coughs> four weeks ago in Pikeville. And we told him, in 15 minutes, we're going to teach you the easy way to raise queens. You come to this cell punch thing, and we're going to teach you how to do this. Dear Gabe, thank you for your help at the queen class in Pikeville. This is somebody just like you who thought they couldn't do it. I have never had success at raising queens until now. I waited till I had a good frame of eggs slash day-old larva, and I punched out 10 one-day-old larvae. Attached is a picture at day five. In other words, they just capped the queen cells. <clears throat> Attached is a picture at day five. I believe I have eight or nine out of the ten that will make it. Thank you, Dick Mullen, Coshocton County Beekeepers. Now that's why we're here. <clears throat> we're here so that you can have this kind of success when you go home. Maybe you want to raise just queens for yourself. That's great. You know, improve your stock. Maybe you want to raise queens for just your bee club. That's great. Good for you. You're going to be heroes in your local area. Maybe you want to raise a few extra and become commercial queen producers. You are going to leave here today and be able to go home like Dick did, Dick Mullen. And you are going to be able to raise queens after today. And um, people will think you're a magician, an alchemist. How do you do that? Tell them how hard it is. <laughs> Raise the price five bucks. <laughs> you know, that's the other thing. Don't undercharge for your efforts. This is you're paying money for this class. You've come a long way. You know, charge what they're worth. Um, I, it's hard to find queens for less than twenty five bucks anywhere. So I hope they're not selling for less than that up here. Anyway, get get good money for your efforts. You're entitled to it. All right, let's go back and talk a little bit about drone biology. Um, <clears throat> this. Is the this? I know you think it's the other end, but that is really an important part of drone biology. Those big monster eyes up there. Those eyes have ten thousand facets in them, as opposed to a queen who has twenty nine hundred. So the purpose of those eyes, the better to see you with, my dear. Mm -hmm. Right? She's flying, and there's a bunch of them, and they have got to see her, and they have got to fly, and they have got to be one of the. 15 or 20 that reach her, or their genes die and their line dies. So those eyes are there, and that's, of course, how you see them. You'll see there's no stinger on the end. Uh, the, the drones have none. They'll start going out about uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, and they will fly until the uh, mid-afternoon and come back. Uh, it takes 24 days for a drone to emerge. Remember, it took 16 for a queen. Um, it takes longer for a drone than any bee in your hive to emerge. They're real big. 
and uh, the bottom of them is just sex. I mean, that's what they're there for. You all know the story. They jump up, they fly, they go out there. When the queen flies, they fly after her. The survival of the fittest, the fastest, you know, the strongest catches her, grabs a hold of her, inserts himself. The um, pressure inside of his abdomen causes him to burst, pop, falls back to earth, dying happy. So he's done this thing, and uh, the next one comes, he yanks out what's in there, inserts himself. Anyway, we now know the queens mate with a diverse group of drones. We are told that they fly past the closest drone congregation area, which would be their drones, onto something a little more distant, where there's drones that are not related to her by blood or marriage. And uh, so hopefully she, um, she mates with uh, drones that are not biologically close to her. Because if she does, the sex alleles will match. If they do, they give off a certain kind of smell. The workers will sense that smell, and they will take that, and they will yank that egg out and eat it. They waste nothing in the hive. It's protein, and they eat it. So if you have uh, a brood pattern, and there's you know, big holes all through it, she is not well mated. She did not mate with a diverse group of drones which are biologically distinct from her. Don't sell that queen. Get your head off. And that's why we wait a week or so to begin to see the pattern before we sell our queen. That's why we leave our queen in the nuke and make sure that she is mating good, uh, that she's well mated and has a good, um, strong pattern of eggs. Now, people say to me, well, gee, Dan, um, how do we know the difference between a well mated, a poorly mated queen who's going to have what we call shot brood, holes in the middle of her brood pattern, and a hygienic queen whose workers are going to go in and yank out. Um, larva, not because she's not genetically diverse, but because they had varroa in there. And the answer is, that's why we sell queens before we cap the, the cells. We look and see how many eggs are in there. Eggs, right? We don't wait until it's capped because that's when the workers will uncap it and go in and yank out the larva that have varroa. So we don't judge it by the capped brood having spotty brood. We judge it by looking inside and seeing that the eggs are wall to wall. So there's your tip for you, tip of the day. That also means you can sell your queen a few days sooner because you know from the egg laying pattern that she's a good, well bred, well mated queen. So leave her in there for the good of your, of your customers. Leave her in there until you can see her egg laying pattern on one frame. And as long as she's laying good eggs and the workers aren't yanking every third egg out, then you know you've got a well mated queen. All right, let's see. We've got a drone bees emerging from comb. <clears throat> this is a, an interesting movie. They just sort of caught this, I guess, almost by accident. This started. There it is. Welcome back to Redbrook Farm in Scarborough, Maine. It's extraction day, and it is, watch your shadow please, it's, a distraction, it's extraction day, we've been harvesting honey, and one of the frames that I have here from the uh, center of one of the supers has a whole mess of uh, drone brood. So you want to know why uh, you're looking a queen at excluder? here, a drone brood, and if you look careful, what you can actually see is the bees are actually emerging from these uh, capped cells. This is day 24, obviously, in the life cycle of the, of the drone brood. These are drones, these are males, uh, they have no stingers. And as you can see, they come out head first, and then they start crawling around. And what they're doing now when they're crawling around is getting warm, and they're getting some food. They are eating some of the honey that is on this same frame. What happened was they laid a uh, drone brood in here, and when they did it, they... Um, I must have done it 24 days ago, and the bees that are out here on, on this frame right now, the bees that are on the frame moving around were not here, you know, an hour ago. They've all been hatching, and you can see them actually eating their way out. Their first job is to eat their way out of the frame, and then and you know they're, they do is, they're uh, drone, not worker, because they've got that little bullet head that sticks out. Way out the bigger, frame, so it, it has to stick out. out. Cell, and it's kind of an interesting shot here. You know, right in there. Very interesting shot. You need about 200 drones, drones on first, to make first point. hours of life. These There's about 200 in every hive. 
So, and on the other side, same thing. What you'll see here is three or four of them. They're all cutting their way out. This is day 24. All right, we've heard enough, haven't we? All right, so people say to me, okay, Dan, well, I'm a queen producer. I need more than a couple of hundred. And uh, it takes the drone about two weeks to become sexually mature. They're not mature. They cannot mate the day they come out. That day, they could not go out and fly and mate. It takes a couple of weeks for them to mature. So um, you need to know that, uh, that <clears throat> the time that you can start grafting <clears throat> larva is when your drones are emerging. Right? Because it's going to be then about 12, 13 days from the day you're grafting before your queens come out. It's going to be two or three days before they go on their mating flight. So that's one of the rules of thumb in beekeeping. When can I start raising queens? When you start seeing drones emerging in your hives. Then you know that two weeks from now your drones will be sexually mature. So when you send your queens out, there will be drones in the drone congregation area for your hive and other hives that will mate with them. So that's a good metric for you to know when you can start raising queens in Ohio, when in your area of Ohio, when you start having those drones emerge inside of your hives. So people say to me, Dan, if the queen and the workers are only going to naturally want to raise about 200, um, but I'm a queen producer and I need 20 drones to mate with every queen, and, and that would only be 10 queens worth there. That's if they all survived and all got out there and they all got mated. You know, that's cutting it pretty close. How do I get more? Because I have, a, I have a hive that I think maybe has hygienic genes in it. So I want that to be my drone source if I can be. And so how am I going to do that? And here's the answer. The, they sell those green Pirco frames that are drone, and, and they use them for Varroa control. You get them to lay, and the Varroa go in that one, and you stick it in your freezer and kill them all. And so what you do is you put that frame inside of your drone mother source, and then they'll raise not 200, but 2,000 drones. And then the, the time that you think your queens are going to go out and mate, take a queen excluder and put it underneath the lowest box inside your other hives. And the drones can't get through and get out and go to the drone congregation areas. Huh? There's another little tip for you. So, also remember I told you the queen wants to fly to a place that's beyond the local drone congregation area. So you should probably put this drone source maybe, I don't know, a quarter of a mile away somewhere, east, west, north, and south. If you can be in a perfect world, unless you happen to know where your local drone congregation area is. It would be cool if somebody came up with a neat way of locating that. What, why the green frame didn't quite follow me on that? Um, you, you put the queen excluder in the other hives where you don't want those drone sources mating with your queen because the drones can't get out through that. So if just for a day, you put a queen excluder on your, on your, um, uh, your landing board, your screen bottom board or your solid bottom board, and then put your um, brood chambers on top of that, that day only, the drones in that hive can't get out and go fly and mate with your virgin queens. It's just a way to kind of Try as best you can if you're going to open mate to get the drone sources you want and not have the drone sources you don't. I mean, there's a reason you didn't graft from the queen in that particular hive. You didn't like her for some reason. Well, hell, if you didn't like her, she is carried inside the drones in her hive. If you didn't like her, you're not going to like her daughters. So if you have two wonderful <coughs> hives of bees and you're grafting from one, you want the other to be your drone source, make sure a couple of weeks earlier you put the, the drone frame in there and have her make thousands of drones in there because that's all she'll lay. A queen spreads her uh, back legs and depending on how wide the cell is, she will determine this is a worker cell or a drone cell. I know what to lay in here. It's based on the, the width when she measures that. So the, all they can make on those frames are drone cells that are bigger. So when she gets her, she says, I don't know why they want so many drones, but I'll lay another one. I don't know why they want another one, but I'll lay another one. So it's just, it's just instinct when she gets there. So it's just a way of getting thousands of drones out into your drone congregation areas. Yes, sir. If you just put a frame with no foundation in the hive, Another great they'll idea. a lot more drone cells will draw them that way. Absolutely. And if you, want, way if you want to find your drone congregation areas, yes, I've heard of people putting a helium balloon on yes. a fishing rod and putting a queen pheromone on it and walking around until the drones yeah. lob the balloon. Yeah, I've heard that too. But you'd have to 
You have to have some sense, in my view. And drone congregation areas are off, often at conjunction points. You know, a, a hollow with a little intermittent creek that comes down, and then it, and then you get to the bottom. It's often at a place where two things come together. And there's there's usually kind of an open area in front of one of them, so the bees can easily fly to it. I've never found one, but I haven't gone looking either. But you'd have to look at an enormous area. It'd just be really cool. The only thing I saw was one time they brought in this radar thing, and they actually picked up the drone congregation area on radar. They could see this little cluster of moving things. <laughs> anyway. I've always wondered, when the queen goes out and finds her drone congregation, hopefully, and gets made and all that stuff, how, how does she find where she's supposed to go? Which hive she's supposed to um, that's a really good question, especially because we often set up these hives, and I'm just about done. We often set up these mating hives that look exactly the same. God, I wish I had a picture of Wade Stiltner's crazy, it looked like something psychedelic from the 60s. He's got polka dots of different colors and different designs, different colors. What I do is I keep little stickers. You know, you get something in the mail that's a little sticker, maybe it's a political sticker, something that's a circle with different colors. I stick those right above the place where the queen comes out of whatever hive I've got her in because they'll go out and they'll orient. They'll do a little orientation flight, just like your worker bees do when they first go out and they take a little orientation flight. She orients herself. And so she'll orient herself geographically, but that just tells her, well, this is about where it is. But she's got a great color sense just like bees do. So if you've got a yellow hive and a blue hive and a green hive, she'll know hers is the yellow hive. And she'll come back to the yellow hive. So I always paint my little mating them stickers. Spinners. Um, are, those come from Better Bee, Man Lake, who, who sells them? Some, Better Bee, I think, has got this spinner, which is the coolest thing ever. If you've got mating nukes that just have the little hole in it that they come out, um, you, these spinners are circular, and, um, and you can get different colors of these. They, they come in five or six different colors. You screw them on, one of them opens up wide open, uh, the next one opens it just for, in other words, it's a queen excluder, and then the other one closes it completely, but it ventilates. So that's another way to put a different color on the front of your mating nuke. So I would urge you to do a color, a pattern, yes sir? Bees can count to three too, they've found. If you put three dots or three lines, one, two, or three, they can... I always do it in, in, in threes, like he said. So I do a triangle or I do a line of three when I put these little stickers on the front of my hive, and she will orient to that. Ronnie, are we about done? Just about done. All right. Um, folks, uh, again, uh, we'll be, you'll be able to question Gabe and I when you come to our cell punch method, but um, we do want to hear from you. Uh, we do want to hear that you went home and uh, never thought you could do this, that you were raising queens and that you got eight or nine out of ten. And whatever you do, count, count, count. Don't be like me and Gabe, or especially like me. All right. So thank you very much. We appreciate you, and uh, we wish you lots of success. And uh, this is the queen. This is an example of a queen calendar that Nina likes best because it's kind of colorful. You can find these if you Google them. And then this is success. This is what we're looking for. Thank you, folks. Yes, sir. Set the bar high. That's what you're going to.